Welcome back to Facto Games, and welcome to the city. In Looking Glass Studios' groundbreaking masterpiece and stealth pioneer, Thief the Dark Project, you are Garrett, a thief that grew up as a street kid and was taken under the wings of a friendly yet mysterious group called the Keepers. This group watches over the balance of the city in secrecy, as there are two powers in an ongoing battle. The Hammers, a religious sect that changes the world with progress, and the Pagans, who take the side of nature and worship the Trickster, the powerful lord of all things not made by human hands. Yet when the game was in development, it was planned as something different. True, the medieval atmosphere of the dark and gritty surroundings had always been a main factor. However, the whole gameplay element of stealth wasn't the main focus in this early version. Instead, Looking Glass intended to make a first-person sword-fighting simulator, the story of which being a twisted variation of the Camelot saga. In it, you would play Mordred, the son of King Arthur and enemy of the kingdom. In fact, let's watch the early trailer of that game, which was going to be called Dark Camelot. Looking Glass Technologies, creators of the critically acclaimed Ultima Underworld series, is back with an all-new role-playing game Dark Camelot, featuring our newest and most powerful renderer, the Stargate Engine. This next generation engine combines fast frame rates with advanced texture mapping into a smooth, fluid experience, a true 6D environment. Because of our unique approach to level creation, designers are able to create intricate areas that are truly immersive, from sloping passageways, to underwater tunnels, to arching cathedrals. Coupled with a powerful yet intuitive editor, the Stargate engine allows our designers to create fantastic environments limited only by their own imagination. Stargate is the next step in immersive reality. Building on our proven experience in creating award-winning games, our designers are taking full advantage of the powerful Stargate technology in our latest title, Dark Camelot. Camelot, the word conjures visions of knights in shining armor, peaceful kingdoms, noble quests, where once and future kings rule with wisdom and honor. Forget it. In this Camelot, Arthur is a dictator, Merlin is a psychopath, the knights of the round table are the muscle, and you're public enemy number one. As Mordred, you'll fight to break the yoke of the tyrant king and set your people free. Your quest will lead you through dark crypts and creature-filled catacombs, battling Arthur's most dangerous knights and Merlin's unspeakable creations. You can trust your sword and the friends you make as you search the kingdom for the one thing that will set the people free, the truth about the Holy Grail. Prepare for Dark Camelot. Later on though, Looking Glass Studios scrapped the Camelot concept and instead made a game in which staying hidden from potential threats was the main focus. They drew some inspiration for the visual design and atmosphere from movies like The Third Man, David Lynch's The Elephant Man, and storytelling inspiration from film noir classics such as Chinatown. As they didn't have a name for the game yet, they simply called it what was called on development papers inside the company, The Dark Project. In order to make the game recognizable for what it was, the prefix Thief was added, something former Looking Glass veteran Randy Smith adopted for his first game in the mobile gaming industry, Spider, The Secret of Bryce Manor by Tiger Style Games. Welcome to the age of the great guilds. Some of you might remember one of the most unique point-and-click adventures ever released. Loom, by Lucasfilm Games, who later changed their name to LucasArts. Loom stood out from all the other graphic adventure titles on the market by utilizing an engine that used music instead of verbs to interact with the game world. You clicked on an object and then sang a spell in order to change the fabric of the very nature of that object. And in this case, fabric is to be taken literally, as the fabric of space and time is controlled by the loom, which is guarded by the mysterious guild of the weavers. The game world is inhabited by many guilds, such as the guild of blacksmiths, the guild of glassmakers, or the guild of shepherds. The weavers, however, being feared because of their magic, the weaving of drafts into the pattern of time and space, were banished onto a small island. There are legends that say that no one has ever been able to look under a weaver's hood and live to tell the tale. If you want to check out this amazing fairy tale that's unique to this day, there are some things you have to keep in mind. 
First of all, the game itself is just the second half of the story. The first half consists of an audio drama that was included as an audio cassette in the original box of the game. There are many sources on the internet that have MP3 versions of that audio drama in different languages. So if you're going to experience the story, make sure to experience all of it. Then there's the difficult choice of the version you want to play. There are three main versions available. The 16-color EGA version doesn't look as good as the other versions, and while this was the way it was meant to be played back in the day, and as such does have its nostalgic appeal, this version can safely be dismissed as not that interesting compared to the others. The really difficult choice is between the other two versions, one of them being a CD version with some added graphics and professional voice acting throughout the whole game, so you don't have to read any dialogue text. This version, however, has a serious downside to it. The dialogue itself was drastically abridged in order to fit on the CD. In some instances, this causes the story to get confusing and some sentences seem out of place, because previous sentences were cut. The other game version available is the VGA version that was originally released for a Japanese computer called FM Towns. That FM Towns version doesn't have any voice acting, but the dialogue is unabridged, and this version has the best musical score you can get, consisting of music from Tchaikovsky's Swan Lake, and as music is the main focus of the game, this is a rather strong argument. So choose wisely. And then there's some good news and some bad news. Let's first get the bad news out of the way. The game does have an ending with a quite concluded feel to it, but could just as easily be considered as the beginning of a much larger story. Some developers say Loom was originally planned as the first part of a trilogy. The second part would have been called Forge, and would have followed the adventures of Rusty Nailbender of the Guild of Blacksmiths as the hero. The third game would have been called The Fold, with Fleet's firm flanks as the new protagonist. In both of these sequels, Bobbin, the protagonist of Loom, would have offered occasional help and advice. There are two versions of what exactly would have happened in these sequels, so as soon as you've finished playing Loom, just check out its Wikipedia entry for more details. Oh, and the good news? There is a fan-made sequel to Loom, which is indeed called Forge. The first, quite long chapter of the game is already available for free, so head over to the website of Quilla the Wisp if you want to dive deeper into the age of the great guilds. In the last episode of Fecto Games, we took a look at the early real-time strategy classics Warcraft 2 Tides of Darkness and the first two titles in the Command and Conquer series. But let's go back even further. Let us go back to the very beginning of the real-time strategy genre. There were many strategy games back in the 80s already, and one of them, called The Ancient Art of War, is considered by many as the very first real-time strategy game. However, the combat in that game took place in a completely different manner. You did command your units in an overhead view, but as soon as combat started, you had to click on your units again in order to get to a close-up screen where you could see them in a side view confronting the enemy. From this perspective, you could select specific enemy units to attack. The very first game that stayed in the bird's eye view at all times, also during real-time combat, was Westwood's Dune 2, The Building of a Dynasty, or Battle for Arrakis as it was called in Europe. Dune 2 was based on the legendary sci-fi saga Dune, which consists of six novels by Frank Herbert. One should say loosely based though, as the story doesn't exactly follow the plot of the books. It should rather be considered as a combat simulation that exists in the same universe with many references to the source material. The biggest difference from the books is one of the three factions, or houses, you can pick and play as. The noble house Atreides is considered the good side and home of the protagonist of the book, and the house Harkonnen is the evil side. But the insidious house Ordos doesn't appear in the books at all. It is only mentioned briefly in the 1984 Dune Encyclopedia by Dr. Willis E. McNally. The only two things mentioned about the Ordos are that it's one of the 116 houses that existed at the beginning of the reign of Emperor Muad'Dib, and that its pennant consists of two crossed bones with an ivy garland. The emblem in the game, showing a book encircled by a serpent, is actually the emblem of the House Wallach. Well, artistic license, I guess. For the 1998 Dune 2 remake, Dune 2000, this emblem was kept. But in the sequel to it, 
Emperor Battle for Dune, which was released in 2001, it was changed to a serpent encircling the home planet of the Ordos, the ice-covered planet Sigma Draconis IV. So, that's it for today's episode of Vecto Games. I hope you enjoyed the video and maybe even learned an interesting thing or two. There's still much more to come, so if you like the concept of this video series, please consider subscribing or just search for Facto Games on YouTube every now and then. So if you like, tune in to the next episode. Until then, take care.